हेलो ब्रिज सर प्रणाम सर प्रणाम ग्रुप Uh, self growth group in that i am part of it oh you are in that self growth group yes sir yes okay yeah yeah that's uh, that is shiva's uh, very popular uh, post he does yes. he posts something every day yes sir uh, and very very uh, very lively uh, personal experience uh, yes sir actually there is a demand uh, for him to start a podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh very nice <laughs> so he is thinking about that very nice so to, today is the final live session yeah so yes sir i thought uh, we had a great session last time about the design principle unless there is a unless there is a particular doubt that you have that you want to resolve if there is no doubt then we can finish the rest of the design principles i thought that was a fantastic discussion uh, i don't think anyone has ever discussed the life principles apropos real life experience so you think we can do that because yes, now we have shiva also who can join us and uh, this this interaction that we are having now can be part of the video lectures that we can we can you know Uh, post later on and all that so um, for me i look at the live sessions not at not as the number of people who join but the power of the interaction that can happen and i think interaction can happen between one person can happen with 100 people doesn't matter so mini you want shivagami hi good morning hi yeah shivagami so as yes, last last week Shivagami. <coughs> yeah. So the agenda is the same as last week, Shivagami. Okay. And uh, so let's. So your yeah. contribution is welcome. I think we left off at. Uh, nature is uh, resilient. Correct. Nature is resilient to disturbances, and we kind of uh, left off at that. Let's uh, move on to nature tends to optimize rather than. maximize yeah i just quickly revise the first three so that the context is set yeah yeah please please so nature uses only the energy it needs of course we had lot of discussions on how things the founders as human beings we use lot of energy how can we reduce that nature recycles all materials again i think for that there was lot of objective uh, things that we brought in recycling nature is resilient to disturbance of course uh, there is no there is no it's it's a no brainer as far as what we can learn from nature and um, i think minali finished off that example with saying that the pine cone forest uh, bridge you look, look at the pine forest what the pine pines do there are two types of seeds so once when so when there is a forest fire the second seed is so made that it will burst only if there is a heat on the ground enough only if there is lot of heat on the ground will the second seed burst open so after the fire is over and after the ground is completely burnt the second seed opens up and the seeds are dispersed throughout the forest and the forest grows again so so for that one of the things i learned in life was can i have one backup plan which is extreme backup plan right extreme right let's assume that i that i lose all my money every bit of my money now how am i going to learn from nature to be resilient with that situation i don't want to tell you that i'll come and borrow from you the bridge but i'm just saying that i have some thinking on i have kept some thoughts on what it what it could mean so borrowing from you is of course an option but let's see intense that it and no issues so yeah. <laughs> 
ഇത് പടം ഗുരു ദക്ഷിണ വേണിയോ so nature tends to uh, optimize rather than maximize i think the examples uh, we uh, we've spoken about is the bone essentially you're looking at uh, energy the use of energy and the use of materials both being a uh, very uh, important in nature so therefore there's always a judicious balance between the energy or the materials used up consumed by nature so it's how much resources uh, nature takes in versus how much it expends so there's always a, a judicious uh, balance there and uh, because the use of excess energy can actually impact the survival of an organism adversely this is an important uh, principle that uh, nature always follows and the checks and balances always uh, exist in nature in order to do that and i i think you must have seen the example in the video of the bone so in the human bone itself when you see where there is no load bearing required it's not as if the bone just keeps on accumulating calcium and becomes uh, hard and uh, heavy because that requires more energy to carry around therefore when when the body realizes that there are parts of the bone that do not need to be load bearing those parts are not as uh, calcium intensive as the rest which is load bearing so therefore the energy that is expended in carrying the bone around is optimized and you you see that balance that is happening because only if it's load bearing it needs to be stronger and if it's not then it needs to it need not have as much as uh, material over there so that's a very uh, important example of uh, uh, optimizing versus maximizing and i think this is a very critical uh, uh, principle especially in the human context because it, i think in the human world we always think you know more is better and you know even designs that we do in our uh, you can see industrial design you can see product design in 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 human human designed uh, products and processes you will always see that this is something that's not very well thought out you have these uh, especially you have products that come out let's say a watch or something it's not as if they look at it's always like more is better so they just have all sorts of materials added and you have this creations made which may look aesthetically pleasing or make people feel very uh, uh pleased with having a prestige enhancing kind of product but is that really required is or something is something i i i think we need to think about as well and this of course i'm only referring to luxury products but it's not necessarily only for that it's also in the case of other uh, uh in the case of other products that get uh, designed in the human world so i think that's something that uh, bears thinking of course so out of this has emerged the concept of uh, uh tiny homes so the tiny homes thing is like I, i guess all of us especially in india we know that having a house is an important uh, uh, goal for most people in india and uh, somehow if you can afford it you will look for the largest possible house right so people you have people who uh who build houses with uh, four or five six seven and god knows how many bedrooms and uh, sometimes it's not even needed so as a as a counter to this there is this tiny homes movement which looks at creating small homes that just that is the you know that's just what you need to in order to live so you don't need multiple rooms and multiple uh, baths etc so they try to optimize that the living space and they also of course try to bring in other things like uh, you know self sufficiency as far as energy is concerned and uh, you know reuse of uh, resources like the water etc etc so this is the tiny homes movement which tries to uh, uh, kind of follow this principle of optimizing rather than maximizing because i think uh, especially with respect to housing this is something that happens a lot maximizing uh, which is really not essential or necessary especially in today's context with the housing crisis and uh, of course all the other things that are a problem so that's what we are talking about as far as uh, optimizing and maximizing is concerned uh, many many can i yeah can please I see uh, i mean she has just touched upon the minimum on bone but there is a lot more about bone uh, because i have been doing research on that <clears throat> there is an optimization done in terms of material 
spatially as well as temporally. What do I mean by that? Let's say I have now changed uh, the way that I use my hand, let us say. Uh, and the load that uh, comes on the bone is now different. Let's say a directionally different uh, uh, load is uh, coming onto the uh, hand. Then the hand bone, the bone that uh, we use for hand, automatically reorganizes the material that it has in such a way that the stiffness and strength necessary for that action, which is which is getting repeated, it, it will optimize for that particular uh, uh, activity. So let's say somebody is uh, uh, jogging every day. Now there, there is the stress on the bone that uh, has now increased, right? So uh, bone realizes that and appropriately structures itself in order to withstand that load, enough to take that load. So right. beauty is uh, much more than what uh, we have uh, uh, we have realized as such. Yeah. I guess, Shiva, that's the reason also as, uh, especially women, as they get older, they are encouraged to do uh, weight exercises because otherwise their bones start to become brittle. Right. And even... So, uh, Oh, I have one student working on, uh, uh, who is a dens den dentist working on teeth correction. Right. And it is beautiful, beautiful uh, how uh, it's it's accomplished, right? Right. Uh, just, just the three activities of it uh, growing, it uh, uh, deteriorating appropriately in order for the movement to occur. Right. As per right. the word that, that appears on it. Right. Yeah, I think this is uh, especially, of course, as we have mentioned, there is no uh, less important principle or more important principle, but this is kind of a principle that uh, you'll find uh, relates to many of the other uh, uh, principles as well. Because we spoke about this earlier that these principles are not, uh, are not uh, isolated from each other. And uh, this one is something that you'll find connections to in many, uh, many of the other principles. <clears throat> Yeah. Any, any other example? Sorry, Shiva, go ahead. So, one of the books that changed my life, I think about 15 years ago, maybe a little more than that. Actually, I used to, I don't know whether you remember Manani, I used to make presentations on that book. Uh, the name of the book is uh, Strengths Finder. Dot, Strengths, right, right. Strength Finder. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, so Strengths Finder, the, the beginning of the book asks the question, if your son came home with 95 out of 100 in English and 70 out of 100 in maths, then which subject would you send your son for tuition in? 99 out of 100 parents would send the child for tuition in maths. But what the Strengths Finder recommends, I'm talking about the book, I'm not talking about me. What the Strengths Finder recommends is that you send your son for tuition in English rather than on maths, because the principle of strengths finder is that would you rather that your child be excellent or, you know, what is that called? What's that word for? Uh, mediocre. 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 So what would, I, what, we, what would we go after? Mediocrity or excellence? So mediocrity is putting our hands in everything, constantly comparing ourselves with other people, doing things that we are not strong in, acquiring several, several, several qualifications just because we are insecure, all the time worrying that somebody else has this degree, I don't have this degree, somebody else can speak, I have to attend for a, I have to go for a public speaking program, I have to go for a writing program. So constantly worrying about what I don't have, while the opposite view is saying, let me do what I can do very, very well, and go ahead and completely optimize that talent of mine rather than maximizing everything that I have. So I thought there's a lot of connection to what nature is doing and what we as human beings don't do, which is to constantly acquire qualifications, degrees, comparisons, this, that, and lead a life of mediocrity. So I, I found some parallel there. It's a fantastic book. It's, it's got an assessment. You can assess yourself and find out what your strengths are. That book sort of changed my life because it helped me understand 
that I don't have to compare myself with everyone else. And there are certain strengths that I have that no one else may have and vice versa. That's an interesting uh, perspective of... But uh, Shiva, just a quick thing here. Do you think that is about maximizing one's strength or optimizing? The optimizing part. See, what we are looking for is what are we learning from nature in real life here? Right, right. So I don't want to copy the entire sentence and say, you know, it, it may not fit that way. Got it, got the word it. optimize gives me that thinking. Sure. Yeah, uh, in in scientific parlance, when we say optimize, it means that we either minimize or maximize based on the constraints mm -hmm. and the objective that is there. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, uh, whether we should put it as rather ma maximize rather than maximize, or just say it tends to optimize. It right. would be much better if we just say it, nature tends to optimize. Okay. I, I I was thinking about one 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 uh, one point about this same point. Uh, uh, say as as we will uh, go <laughs> further more into three uh, D printing, printing and or maybe uh, additive manufacturing. So mm. that time, the right now the the parts are being made uh, straight lines. All this done because the making of the part is suitable for that purpose. So the moment we go for a better of three uh, D printing or additive manufacturing that then our system also will kind of optimize as we go ahead okay okay so what about the next one nature provides i'm just hurrying up because i you know it'll be nice if we can finish many things today sure. nature provides mutual benefits Many. i think instead of just me starting a thing maybe we can just start talking about it because this is quite uh, this is something i guess we observe a lot so anything please feel free to jump in and start okay two books have been recommended by shiva instead of just me starting a sorry who is this no, no. Uh, I think the I was I'm also on the live uh, session on YouTube, so that got unmuted. Yeah. <laughs> so nature provides you uh, many. Uh, just revise those three three types of dependence. No, that day we were talking about in nature. So uh, actually, that was for the resilience uh, part, uh, Shiva. Yeah. What? But... Acha cha nature. Okay, okay. Three types of dependence. Acha cha. You're talking about the types of uh, mutual benefit relationships that. Very Okay, okay. So there is, uh, you have uh, competitive or parasitic relationships, and then you have... Uh, Wait, one minute. Competitive or parasitic? Parasitic relationships where, uh, you know, competitive is, of course, you know what it is. There is a competition for resources. And parasitic is one is benefiting, one is not. And then you have a, a, a cooperative relationship or uh, symbiotic collaborative. relationship. Yeah, uh, symbiotic relationships where one is ben both are benefiting. So you have this, uh, you know, for example, this uh, uh, the clownfish and the sea anemone. So the sea anemone is that uh, organism that you see which has all these uh, tentacle-like things. So those tentacles actually will not allow any other uh, organism in the sea actually to come near it because it will sting that animal because it protects itself like that. And it also keeps the predators away like that. But uh, the clownfish is actually uh, unaffected by it because it has, a, uh, it has a layer on its skin that protects it from those things. So it, it goes into the sea anemone and it, uh, it lays its eggs and protects its eggs from other predators. But at the same time, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, clownfish also provides benefits to the sea anemone by uh, keeping predators away, etc. So that is a, a beneficial, mutually beneficial relationship that happens between these two organisms. And then you have a commensal relationship where one is benefited and the other is not affected at all. And uh, the example there is of the, uh, the shark and the remora fish. So the remora fish attaches itself uh, to the shark and uh, the shark goes around the sea and the remora fish does not have to spend any uh, energy swimming. 
So, and it also feeds off the scraps of the shark and uh, et cetera. So the shark is pretty much unaffected by the remora and the remora is actually getting the benefit. So that's a commensal relationship. So you will find all these kinds of relationships in, um, uh, in nature. And uh, to recognize that and see, okay, is there a lesson that we can take in this? So we also, yeah. So I don't know, uh, mutual benefits uh, in real life. Uh, I, it's, uh, you know, I think an employment agency, there is mutual benefits because I provide, I provide work for my employer. My employer gives, gives me money, right? So, but I, family, I think, do we call, can we call children as parasites? <laughs> <laughs> because they don't, I'm just, I'm just trying to lighten up the mood, right? You know, where is the parasitic? I know a lot of people take a lot of stuff and don't give back, which is, could be, but I, I don't know. I think humanity is more about mutual benefits. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I think that's a very ideal state, but do we really mutually benefit each other? I don't know. I'm going to leave that for a larger discussion. So one, uh, one um, thought here is, or rather one way of thinking is that at least in the uh, natural world, even if you have parasitism uh, or competition, uh, from a systems uh, view of uh, the whole thing, you can actually say that it is beneficial for the system. So it's not as if uh, that it's a bad thing. So competition is good. Uh, even parasitis, uh, parasitic uh, relationships end up being beneficial from a system's view. So that's what the, uh, that's why it exists, by the way, in, in the natural world. And I think taking off from what you said, Shiva, that I think even in the human world, you will find all of these relations, these types of relationships that happen, whether it's at individual levels or in a group or a group with an individual or anything of that. And I guess that's kind of what makes um, the world run, right? So I'm not sure one is better than the other. Right. I, I don't really think no, we can no, say I, that. No, right. Even this parent, even this children, I tell you, one of the best years of my life have been the benefits I've received from my children by way of love and affection. Right. So it was said in a jocular way. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean that it has to be given back by way of material things. Mm. It can also be intangibles that we get from people. For instance, when we help people, Supposing I give someone some money, I'm not getting anything in return. But apparently there is some chemistry, something happens in my body which helps me be joyful when I give in charity. Right. So the, the opportunity for giving someone itself, I have to be thankful to that person. I have to I say, Minalni, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to serve you. Right. And that's I, I learned it in a in a in a guest house I was in. TCS had, I had gone for some work and there was this guest house, and this man was giving, was cooking the food and giving it to us. And he was constantly asking me, you know, do you want some more chapatis? Do you want this? Do you want that? I told him, boss, why don't you sit down with me and eat? I told him. Why don't we eat together? He said, No, no, no. For me, it gives me great pleasure in helping you enjoy the food and please don't deny me of that pleasure because I love to serve you the food and, and in service and many of our spiritual leaders also talk about how service itself is an opportunity for enjoyment. Right. Right. And I think many of Shiva, our... I think there is one more point. I'm sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead, Shiva. See, there's one more point about children. When you say children, <clears throat> it is also about the mutual benefit in terms of progeny. That is uh, continuing my race. Right. I'll continue. So in that sense, uh, survival uh, it has been one of the links uh, when, when we talk about children. Correct. Right. We see, we see the entire generation in there, in them. 
and many people yeah very good shivagami is very quiet today shivagami we haven't heard you at all you are in mute mute it shivagami you are mute unmute and clear on this uh, optimization only i was thinking that is the uh, uh, main interesting thing for me like uh, i was trying to work in this for the past uh, in my domain actually uh, like nanalili pointed out this tiny homes or small homes that is evolving as a culture now uh, actually in a small uh, square feet you try to accommodate everything including their uh, energy needs and uh, their uh, spatial requirements and uh, for the required number of people uh, that is one thing that is uh, i'm passionate of doing about uh, that's okay. what i was thinking of this optimization and uh, when it's uh, it's coming up as a culture now uh, rather than as you were pointing out rather than going for multi rooms and uh, and uh, definitely the energy requirement also increases it's like optimize at the uh, demand level itself reduce the energy demand itself with right. uh, in, 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 in terms of spatial requirement but also in terms of energy requirements sure. uh, and then there you try to accommodate all the needs in that uh, minimal space and you bring in the comfort that they need you point it out in terms of comfort that is also satisfied uh, right. that's evolving as a culture actually so shivagami i i okay i i am also very fond of this tiny home thing i'm go, so i'm going to start looking for people who who want to join in buy a plot of land and build nice tiny homes and uh, we do that then we can also satisfy nature provides mutual benefits so bridge mohan can have a dining room in his house and i will i can have a living room in my house and i can go and eat in his house and he can come and watch tv in my house <laughs> so uh, you know i'm just thinking that maybe the way we construct apartments can change with that uh, lesson from nature why why should every one of us have a kitchen why can't we have a common kitchen why should every one of us have you know separate 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 things why can't we what i don't have he will have and what he doesn't have i will have if we can if we can create an apartment where i buy the provisions and you buy the vegetables you know we can i i'm i'm actually starting to dream now it's it can be a but, yeah. ideal world was, i think this There's kind of a... this kind of commune kind of living is quite uh, yeah. you know some people are attuned to it more than others it requires a huge shift in the way we think about uh, how we need to live and uh, fantastic i, I mean somehow I, I, it's, a, it's like a it's like a deliberate mutual interdependence yeah. so beautiful uh, you know see Sh shiva is very good in maths mini you are good in science shivagami may be good in something bridge so we can run a school in the apartment we don't even have to send our children to school right we can do home schooling and we can use the playground for all the children to play in it's right. so beautiful the thought the thought is so beautiful that all the apartment owners can teach something to the children and the children can do home schooling and they can spend a lot of time playing around instead of wasting time in school right this is what they were existing in the rajasthan junagar uh, district uh, earlier there used to be a fort the entire city was fortified and uh, something similar to the community kitchen there people used to work there and uh, Just to provide uh, supply food for the entire city, so it was easy for the king to protect that entire tribe. When if there was some uh, emergency or some external uh, this occurring, so something similar concept. Even the schools, it was something to a group system. Whoever were inside, they only come and teach. Early morning, they used to get up and uh, that spiritual thing, and even the warfare that was taught by the people inside itself. So it's something that we can take from the ancient thing also. Right. Uh, Wow. and even in modern context when they say it was tiny homes it's like uh, having uh, the functional uh, uh, bedroom your living room and uh, dining in the same space like similar to your space saver kind uh, but it's not to we should remember not to go for the electric powered one just for the simple jack system the the uh, table that can be folded and kept off in the wall itself or a bed or a inbuilt uh, uh, about the whole wall entire wall these are all some prototypes even actually we are working on uh, 
when I was in Dubai, actually. We had worked on a few prototypes. And if people are interested, yes, it's, uh, they really like it. After we do that and uh, uh, deliberate, we, uh, we inculcate all their these needs and then deliver it to them. Yeah, if they like it, yes, it's a real good concept, actually. Actually, they say, uh, uh, I don't know whether Shiva remembers, about three years ago, we had this uh, program called Discovering Creativity. Even now we have it at IIT Madras. And one of our students came back with a brilliant idea. She said, why should every hosteler buy the same things? For instance, why should everybody oh, yes. have a screwdriver? Why should everybody have their own individual broom? Yeah. Why should everybody have their mop? So she, if we have developed. data of who has what, if room number she one has a nap. mop, if room number two has broom, if room number three has screwdriver, room number four has a spanner, and there can be an app to find out who has what, we can exchange our goods, right? Well, we can we can spend less money on buying things that other people already have. And we can... In fact, uh, Shiva, them. she later developed an app. Yeah, yeah, she did that. I remember. She did that. Yeah, very nice. Good. Not bad. So much of uh, discussion on mutual benefits. Thanks to nature. <laughs> All right. Next one. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one, uh, which also prompts a lot of discussion in our other classes. Uh, nature runs on information because it seems very, uh, it seems like a very bare bones kind of statement. And uh, I guess. For me, it is the most difficult one. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it uh, merits a lot of uh, discussion even during our classes. Yeah. So I guess the whole thing here is about this ability to constantly uh, scan your environment, get signals from the environment and respond to it accordingly, which is what we talk about in nature because survival kind of depends on it in nature. Because if the animal is not attuned the, not just an animal, but the organism is not attuned to that, then it doesn't receive the, uh, receive the inputs that it needs for its own survival. So this is, I think, something that we recognize very well in nature. And we can say that to a large extent in our human world, especially today, we do run on information as well. And uh, however, do we, do we kind of align this with the other principles as well and look at how we can uh, bring in that concept of the feedback loop to ensure that we are uh, doing what is needed is, I guess, what this uh, principle talks about. Any other thoughts here? So uh, one thing about, about this in the real world, Mini, when, I, when we teach creativity, we talk about information as critical to, mm. to, to creativity. And, and there seems to be a parallel in what you're saying. So the plant will sense a danger and create a way to, to survive. Right. To ward off the danger. Right. So if I'm going to take the word information, information is key in creating new ideas. Unless I know what is in the refrigerator, I will not be able to find out what I should make for my children. Right. So there's a huge connection between information and creativity. Right. And I guess... I guess that's one loose or tight, I don't know, but something to the real world that I can think of. Right. I see a comment by uh, Praneet. I'm not sure what, uh, what you're trying to... I think Praneet was talking about mutual benefits. I see, okay. Praneet, sorry. We, we, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yes sir. actually, I want to uh, discuss that uh, there is one similar pattern uh, occurred between uh, Sorry, the plant. You introduce yourself first. Yeah, I am uh, Pranit. I finish my B in electronics. Uh, so what do you do now? Is, uh, I am working. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 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 actually, there is one similar uh, pattern occurred between the plant. Uh, uh, how a seed on the earth surface will look like and a mother womb or a parent or female womb that can be uh, okay. 
an animal or a human being if you observe the mother womb in a horizontal way it okay. it's look like a seed that is generating from the surface of the earth okay got it that's what i want to thank you pradeep yes thank, coming back to thank you thank you any any yes, other thoughts is it uh, yes yes hello yes uh, yes yes now i am able to hear okay thanks pradeep information anything other than what yeah see talk? information is also provided in terms of various ways by which animals uh, protect their territory protect right? their territory for example dog uh, protects its, uh, its territory by informing through its uh, uh, you know ex excretion right so information um uh, that is available there helps the other animal not to enter into that territory and so on absolutely and i i think there is this is taking this a little further even the information like we all keep saying that the na nature cannot speak and tell us right even the communication that happens within uh, uh you know social groups like let's say the honey bees etc it actually happens uh, the information exchange is through uh, pheromone trails so the the the, the entire uh, uh, hive actually communicates with each other using a pheromone trail and each of those individual interactions add up to uh, add up to do something that is beneficial for the entire hive mm. so that's how the information exchange happens uh, within a, and this is in fact imitated in uh, some uh, systems and i think we've uh, already yeah. mentioned this kind of uh, thing using it for uh, you know uh, doing energy management uh, in buildings and so on and so forth so yeah. that's uh, something that uh, we th we don't realize that it's happening all the time i think the example of the wood wide web is also very pertinent here and about how trees communicate with each other so we just because we don't see it we don't recognize it but uh, it's something that's happening all the time Yeah. it's happening around us it's happening below our feet it's happening all the time and we need to recognize that and find out if there is a lesson to take from that yes bridge go ahead a uh, two days back there's a news in the paper mm. about this humpback whales mm. so what they have found out researchers found out that they have their own songs mm. so uh, okay. like one community in the pacific ocean if they have song they somehow it travels to the other part of the world Right. And other right. other uh, other whales also uh, sort of start singing those that those kind of song or whatever that. Right. So right. It's uh, it's very mind boggling that how can how come uh, the whale song can reach other part of the world without right. having the GPS or no connection only somehow in the travel in the water or something. Water, water. correct, correct. So they have their family songs. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, in fact, I think I I read something about it. There is this whale which is actually older than the others. and uh, it's looking for a mate and none of the other whales are able to hear that specific frequency and that specific uh, uh, signal that the whale is sending out and therefore this whale is actually alone so that's what i read uh, uh, i don't know if the same uh, article that we are uh, referring to but i read that actually a couple of days ago as well so that's what uh, scientists studying the whales have figured out as to why this whale is alone because the other whales are not able to recognize that so so when we talk about information related to survival in nature right then how can we use it in our own lives so do you think that information about our own body and about the problems that we we encounter as we go along right mm. being getting tested for diabetes regularly mm. getting tested for blood pressure regularly as people grow older making them go for medical examinations so that they so that any cancer anything is detected early can help us to save money save costs save lives and all that 
right? Maybe, uh, maybe because many of my friends are very reluctant to even go for a medical test. They say it's bunkum and even blood test, they don't want to go. But I know that many of my cases, many of my friends who have got cancer, etc. If only they had gone earlier, the cancer could have been detected much earlier. So I see a parallel between how nature uses information to protect itself and how human beings can use information to protect themselves, both physically and emotionally. For yeah. instance, if I know that some of my mates or some of my friends are, are sapping my energy, are making me more and more depressed, that information about them can make me stay away from them, go after people who like me, who encourage me, rather than constantly be with someone who is, who is, who is taking away my, my, my spiritual, my, my mental energy. Are we, the question therefore is, are we using information judiciously? Can we use it better? Yeah, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it as well. I think uh, uh, seeking information and, and acting on information is something that we can definitely uh, learn from in, as far as this principle is concerned. And maybe we don't do it as often. Sometimes it's, it's more of, uh, it's more of, you know, trying to uh, having this thing about, oh, what if it says something that I don't want to hear? We don't want to go for a test because we are afraid of the results. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's what happens in many cases, that they're afraid to know what the test is going to tell them. <clears throat> yeah. And I guess that doesn't happen so much in the animal world because it's more in terms, of course, it is survival for humans as well, but we have these tools and uh, we have these uh, additional crutches that we can use to help ourselves. And uh, therefore we don't, we tend to ignore it more. In the language of the nature can be different. Right. Not be the sounds that we use. But yes, information is passed on, information is used, and information is delivered. And I think this is like kind of been honed over centuries, right? So it's it's yeah, many actually quite actually yes. huh. yeah. No, if you look at DNA, it carries information. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and it's beautiful. I mean, it, it carries so much information. Uh, that my eye does not grow as of elsewhere, but only uh, on my face. I mean, it's, it's so beautiful uh, when you look at uh, the information being stored, <laughs> used. You know, I, I believe uh, even information about uh, you know somebody getting a uh, getting cancer at right. a particular age also is uh, transferred through genes to generations. I mean, what is that test called? That genetic test we have? Uh, some test is there. There is a test, I forgot. Yeah, there's a name of a test. That we yeah, I think there's, they have these markers also that they have uh, come up with. The markers are there. Yeah, the markers which actually tell you your uh, the, uh, the likelihood of uh, getting cancer, etc. So yeah, these yeah. gene tests are there which help you do that. Right. Yeah. Next one, nature uses chemistry and materials that are safe for living beings. Right. I think this is, again, something that something that we can uh, take from, especially given the kind of uh, uh, toxic materials that we have been using for creating all sorts of, uh, all sorts of structures, all sorts of uh, things in, our, in the human world, the solutions that we create. And nature's chemistry is actually, you know, just a few, just a few uh, elements that are abundantly used, and uh, the the DNA uh, part of it is also uh, interesting here that the entire DNA is made up of only five elements, and that encodes all of the information that is there for life today. Every animal, every organism, how how does it, uh, you know, the the the, the genetic information is actually encoded in this DNA, which is made up of only five uh, basic elements. So that's the interesting part here. And yeah. all of 
Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Here, I think we can't look at the word chemistry and materials and save. We have to look at that Janine Benio statement saying nature creates conditions conducive to life. Sure, That's sure. So I think here it's the philosophy behind that statement mm. saying that are we doing things in this world that are harmful to others? Right. Which is what the basic tenet of biomimicry is that nature creates conduce conditions conducive to life. That nature right. doesn't destroy, but nature nurtures. So mm -hmm. are we as human beings doing things that destroy other people, either emotionally or physically? Or are we creating conditions for people to thrive? Right. Since the concept of IIT Madras is about thriving, is about students thriving. Mm -hmm. right? So within IIT Madras, are we creating systems that help students thrive? Right? IIT Madras, any other college, any other institution, any family, in our own families, are we having something that will not make people thrive? Are we discouraging people too much, shouting at someone too much? I think it's a, it, it, this, this topic can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Shiva has sat in front of the chair, so that means there is something. <laughs> no, no, uh, I've been thinking about it. Uh, see, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about how it can get kind of translated into uh, the design. Mm -hmm. What we can learn uh, from this in terms of design. So one of them is, of course, using materials that are safe. That's, that's one thing. Second, I think, what, what are, when we are creating something, are we creating things that can harm others, even, even words, for instance, the words that I utter are after all something that I create. So, <clears throat> every time I speak, I'm creating some new phrase, new words. So, am I hurting others by that or helping others with that? Sivagami is deep in thought. Up there, very quite uh, pitchy, right? Sorry, can't hear it. Madurai. Ah, the whole of Madurai has become silent now. <laughs> no, no, I was just thinking like whenever we are discussing something here, I am able to hear both the sides, like personal point of view and uh, like a technical point of view, the, the Shiva is adding value. So like uh, when we continue this, uh, it will be great if we can do a short video like uh, for each thing, uh, like even uh, age of 20, they can understand uh, to give the insight, like, uh, say a statement, how it is like personal point of view how it can be really beneficial and also from there how you infer and take it uh, uh, scientifically. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so me, that's one of the one of the purposes of what we want to do. When we say learning from nature. Yeah. So the other portion of biometry, which we call as biometry 1.0, is learning from nature, learning the technology of nature. But there can also be another aspect to biomimicry which has not been explored yet is what we are doing now. Which is why this makes the session interesting because it must be one of those few groups in the world which are actually finding parallels of behavior rather than of technology. So here, uh, which is why uh, your YouTube idea, your, your video idea is a good idea because then the totality of teaching from nature becomes... You know, so I'm not only learning technology from nature, I'm also learning behavior from nature. Yeah. About this point number seven, I sometime back there was one program in my office. So, like they were saying, about there was five ways a chemistry can play a role in the organization in into the initial world. Is is chemical way, material way, energy management, communication and defense, or a, uh, defense or uh, predation. Uh, 
so uh, like like all all this uh, snake or the scorpion or all they 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 all is basically chemistry kind of thing to to survive and thrive or uh, so the then the nature runs on the chemistry i think so what is it that makes us use harmful chemicals maybe for for that particular species it can be it is useful for them like a uh, snake uh, some venom no, it is human beings no i'm stuck i question is i guess in the human uh, world why is why, it that why do we use, use harmful chemicals knowing they are harmful i mean we are we are eating the same thing right we we are using harmful acid in our homes which can destroy but we still use it we use it for children we give plastics to children we give um, children boiling milk in plastic bottles our own children we forget the world i am harming myself why i i have not understood that maybe it's not the right forum for discussing it but the question the larger question is why do we harm in spite of knowing that it is harmful our own selves in my house there is so many things that harm my body and then i pay money to the doctor <laughs> and spend money okay so let's go to the next one nature builds using abundant resources yeah i think there are lot of connections to uh, uh, especially number 1 number 4 uh, and number 7 here in terms of looking at abundant resources as important to build something rather than going after the rare resources and also ensuring that the resources that you are uh, getting are not you're not expending undue amount of energy in order to get it as far as nature is concerned which is of course in direct contrast to what happens in the case of human uh, uh, in the human world where uh, the 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 uh, we always strive to get many of these rare resources we expend a lot of energy to get these rare resources so whether it is the metals and the minerals like gold and platinum or it's about uh, you know using them for what we build when we i say build not just houses but also other things that we create the 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 premium that we place on rare resources and 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 creates this thing that these are better than those that are made with abundant resources correct very that somehow somehow uh, that is ingrained in our psyche as humans i guess so if you have a house that is built of marble and granite we automatically think that it is better than a house that is made with local materials like <laughs> mud and uh, thatch i mean forget the fact that's also because the 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 pattern that has set in our heads right so if i have if i'm going to build a house now if i say i'm going to use the local uh, mud and thatch i'm sure my family is going to come and say what is going on what are you doing and things like that to me right so that somehow this abundant resources is become a, a something that we don't care as much as we care about rare resources we want to go after rare resources we don't mind uh, expending more resources in order to acquire those rare resources so that's something that is i think uh, very very uh, very very uh, what should i say widespread prevalent in our human world and uh, that's something that uh, nature doesn't do <laughs> coming back to the human world mini mm -hmm. i also think that we attach aesthetic value to rare resources right we yeah. think that <laughs> a necklace made of gold because it is rare is more beautiful than a necklace made of iron or shells or shells correct something to do with aesthetic <laughs> anything that is rare seems to be aesthetically beautiful even though for me personally i would rather have an iron necklace or a steel necklace rather than a gold necklace right somehow I... we have been able to we are connecting aesthetics and rarity as beautiful right. 
Also, it's not just for jewelry or luxury items, you know. It's what, like what I said, even for things like what we build our house out of, what we build uh, our, our, uh, the objects in our house out of, right? So automatically, if you have a... a, a, a gold, you know, gold, let's, gold you know, <laughs> yeah, that not, I'm not going to that kind of thing. Even what we build in our house, like furniture, etc. right? We want to use uh, rare materials and say, mm. I got this, uh, you know, very, very uh, rare uh, XYZ wood. I don't even know what wood from somewhere. And I have made this table and uh, look at this study table and things like that. Whereas I have abundant uh, uh, wood available, let's say locally or in the local market. I don't want to use that. And even if you go to a furniture store, he that guy will actually say, this is country wood, that is uh, a rosewood, teak wood, uh, this wood, that wood. Okay, I think there is some of the some of the things you can understand because some of these woods are better at resisting pests and things like that. They are more termite resistant. They last longer and so on and so forth. But uh, beyond that, I'm also saying that this whole thing about having having a premium on only rare items and I guess it's kind of a vicious cycle, right? They are rare because they are less available and somehow we have kept on attaching a premium to it. So then that cycle continues and we don't want to look at other uh, options at all. And therefore we become very uh, dependent on that. And it creates all sorts of sometimes artificial shortages uh, in terms of people wanting to acquire it. So that's, uh, that's just something that I think uh, happens in the human world a lot. I mean, you can, you can look at, you can look at several such examples. I mean, this is just two examples that we can think of, but there are several such examples. Yeah, actually, this uh, personally, I feel it uh, applicable to our uh, basic requirements of like like food, clothing, and shelter. And uh, Brunali, you have been giving good insights on the shelter part, like for how we are doing for homes and everything. And mm -hmm. even for food, for preparation of food, everything. Now we are not content with a smaller one. We go for microwaves and uh, many, many additional things. And after three years, we end up saying food used in microwave was so consumed regularly, they get cancer and all these things. But mm -hmm. when we, we go to a certain level and then we try, uh, we then uh, we are trying to incorporate, no, no, that's not good. Let's come back here like that. So in everything, it goes like that. Maybe it is uh, a community pressure or uh, I don't know how to say that. And when Shiva was pointing out this uh, community schooling, like uh, why should you why should you send a child to travel 20, 30 kilometers and even for college, they uh, uh, commute one hour from their home. They spend uh, that much uh, greenhouse gas emission, everything takes place. We mm. travel minimum one and a half hours, then uh, uh, up and down, say three hours. But uh, earlier, this system was good, right? That, like in certain radius of the your shelter itself, you are able to uh, find the education. Then uh, that solves many other problems as well. So food, clothing, shelter, everything is applicable. And when you were saying about this uh, schooling, uh, that's what this uh, homeschooling is all about. Uh, right. what, like when you have a waste in the... Like, uh, uh, plywood or something. I was trying to integrate this. Just uh, cut it and do a small carpentry and make a study desk, which uh, every everyone is not able to accept. That it. it's like uh, go to some branded showrooms, like and uh, take a good uh, study desk, which should have backlit and this that a minimalistic thing which can, you can create from base. So we have right. to set example uh, for ourselves and also for the next generation. Let us to come as a uh, commit uh, no base. Not just right. uh, one level, grassroots level, this has to happen. Right. Absolutely. Right. Any other any other thoughts on this? I think the uh, nature you build using abundant resources is, is very connected to, as I said, to the other uh, principles that we have been speaking about with respect to materials and energy, as well as optimizing and maximizing. Because uh, nature is always looking at, at, because it's looking at optimizing rather than maximizing and judicious balance of uh, resources taken in versus resources spent, 
it kind of also becomes important to use abundant resources. Okay, <clears throat> shall we move on to the next one? Uh, if there are no other. Yeah, uh, we have about five minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to, you know. So, um, yeah, any locally attuned and responsive, I guess, from a, from any examples is anyone wants to share in terms of locally attuned and responsive? So I know what it, what it, what is the biomimicry example by what, what animal, what organisms do. They don't, they, they look at what is around them and use that as materials. In real life, the question is, do I really know my environment? Sometimes I don't know. In my own flat, I don't know who is who. So, so therefore, socializing, I think, is a very important thing I'm picking up from here. Can I get to know my community better? Can I get right. to know who are the singers around me? Who are the teachers? Who are the doctors? Who are the people who can add value to my life? Can I... So somehow we are so close nowadays, we just close our door and sit in our house all the time. We don't even bother to go and introduce ourselves to our neighbors. Mm. So that's the, that's the response I'm, I have for that as to how I can use this in nature. Mm. Or on the other hand, can I tell everyone what I know and what I can do for them? So if they, someone needs help, Right? They can come to me and I can help them. Right. Because, for instance, I speak French and I would gladly love to teach French on weekends. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of my neighbors who are sending their children very far away to learn French. Because they don't know, I have not even told them that I speak French. So, if I tell them that, you know, if all of us as a community advertise what we can do for others, then everybody knows everything. They'll say, oh, why should we go so far away to learn French? We can go to Shiva's. Shiva, are you available on Sunday between 5 and 7? We'll send our children to teach, learn French. See how close we are, right? Right. Which is I think this is kind of also related to the one on information because... Uh, if you have to be locally attuned, obviously there is an exchange of information that has to happen. And that's something that uh, I guess in the human world, there is a lot of it that is wanting uh, as well. <clears throat> and getting that local uh, information, being locally attuned and more importantly, responding to that and being able to do something is I guess important. In nature, it's very obvious how it happens, but uh, what is the kind of lesson that we can take in the human world here is uh, something that we need to see. Okay, and shall we go to the next one? Unless there's some, some comment from any of you, Bridge or Sivagami, any comment? Okay, fine. Final one, Mini. Yeah, nature uses shape to determine functionality. I guess uh, doesn't I uh, need too much explanation because uh, in nature, you will always find that shape is determined by what functionality needs to be accomplished by that shape. Unlike in the human world where sh shape is there just because there is material available and we want to create a shape. There need not be a functional reason for it at all. And that's something that we can find examples of all around us, right? And it ties into uh, it ties into a lot to the other uh, principles that we have been speaking about. Big is beautiful. But, yeah, big is beautiful. Uh, use uh, I use rare resources because I can, and I there is no need to use those rare resources. And this is not so much in terms of shape where you have these diamond studded watches and phones and etc. Right? For what are we doing it? Nothing doesn't serve any purpose. Okay, you can argue it serves a purpose of enhancing my, uh, what I think is my status and prestige, but uh, yeah, it's, there's really no purpose of it. Things that are uh, made in a certain shape or something just so that, because we can do it, because we have the technology to do it. Whereas in nature, obviously that's not the case. 
nature, any shape has a, a reason behind it. And I think this is something, you know, there is a design movement that talks a lot about this, that there are designers who, who, who say that we should not have wasteful design. So we should not create, we should not create designs that are designed for the sake of design. We should create a certain shape. We should create certain uh, features only if it is required. Because, uh, you know, design is a very abused word in the human world, of course, because anything and everything is called design these days. And uh, that's something that it's an important lesson saying when we are designing, are we conscious about, hey, is this required? And is this the shape that we need to create? Or is there something that we can do to make it, uh, you know, uh, aligned with the function that the object uh, creates? And I think that's that's probably something that we need to uh, we need to think about. And uh, there could be a lesson from that example of the first ever invention of mankind, which is the hand axe. Right, right. Hand axe, where a small axe. So once once we started once we started uh, becoming hunters, we had to open out the carcass of the animal. So we created the hand axe. The hand axe is something that fits in the palm of your hand. And very interestingly, the mouse that we use also fits into the palm of the hand. The hand axe was created by one person over a long time, while the mouse is created by several people around the world. But both of them, the shape of the hand axe and the shape of the mouse fitting into the palm of the hand becomes critical. So there could be some lesson there as to whether we are creating shape which is functional rather than shape that is decorative or right. wasteful. So I think the point here is not just, okay, aesthetics is important. I think uh, we've all realized that aesthetics is important in the human world because uh, cities and places that are aesthetically pleasing do enhance your uh, emotional well-being as well. So it's not as if aesthetics is not important. But sometimes we confuse aesthetics with a, a made-up uh, concept of uh, status or prestige. And therefore, we say that, okay, this is better to do. And we create things that are really not needed. And that's, that's where I think the wastefulness happens. All right, I think we have come to the end of this session. So, yeah. so good that we finished everything. Um, there's someone, uh, Pavitra, hi Pavitra. Yes, Bridge. So I have one question here I was thinking about uh, for quite, quite some time about this snail. How the snail size become bigger as the snail also start be becoming bigger? Right, right, right. So I was thinking about in case we can use that same principle for the shoes, say example. Hmm. So we don't have to change change uh, children's shoes very often. Same shoes can go for years together. Right, right. Uh, so like so in, in case you have an idea about it. Oh, yeah, actually, actually, there is this company that started it, uh, Bridge. I think they are uh, 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 NGO in Africa or somewhere, where they came up with these shoes, which like you, you have your foot and it has straps like this as well as like this. So what happens is that as the child's foot becomes larger, you can still continue to use the same, uh, the same shoe, at least for uh, you know younger children. I'm not sure if this works for adults. But it works for younger children, definitely. Because, of course, as adults, your shoe size is not going to vary too much. But for mm -hmm. children especially, because they observed that school-going kids in Africa did not have uh, shoes to wear and go, etc. And one of the reasons was the parents were worried about the expenditure on continuously having to buy shoes. So this uh, team actually designed it. I'm not sure if there was just a prototype or... They actually ended up uh, scaling it up, etc. But I do remember reading about this. So they they tried to create something like that, so that uh, you know, let's say you have a child in grade one, the child can actually use that shoe till grade four or five, and it's less of a 
uh, economic burden on the family to be uh, having to buy, uh, you know, shoes kind of every every year or every few months and all that. So that's something that they tried to do. Any any idea about this uh, snail? Uh, how it is grows up? It is okay. quite having hard shell. Right, right. I think the thing is, it's a hard shell, yes, but there is also a flexibility to it, right? And that's probably the reason. I'm no expert, of course. Uh, but I guess that's that's kind of how the snail does it. Um, I guess more details you will have to look for. I'm not. Uh, okay. I don't have that information. Fine. Man. <laughs> okay. So good that we finished all the ten principles. We are coming to an end of the uh, end of all our live sessions. Hopefully, we will meet in person. Bridge uh, Sivagami, Praneet, and Pavitra. So let us know. Keep in touch. Write to us. You have our email IDs and uh, LinkedIn and all that. And therefore, it's been an absolute pleasure doing this program. It was completely accidental, thanks to COVID. So mm -hmm. because COVID uh, made me and Manali sit at home, so we said, what do we do? So we said, instead of sitting at home and doing nothing, let's learn a new subject. And uh, 2021, we we went to the website we started learning it and here we have a program we have people like you and uh, we are very proud of uh, of how how nature has been able to teach us and so let's continue the discussion uh, let's continue being in touch yeah thank you it's been a pleasure yes, i think it's been a great uh, nice to see that uh, you know there are more people in biomimics who are willing to uh, embrace this and take it forward so uh, we are we love that so shiva and i can keep uh, talking about it every day and uh, nice to see that there are like minded people as well just a quick thing i spoke about the shoe i just found the link i just uh, posted it on the on the thing as well the snail one of course you will have to look up uh, bridge yeah um, yes yeah and as as uh, anything else, ma'am? Uh, Shiva, give me. No, no, else? nothing else. Nothing else. So thank you, and uh, we hope uh, you know we get to see you uh, maybe in by Minute Two Point Zero as well. And and from from uh, the participants' uh, side, on behalf of all the participants, we are thankful to you for taking time. And and uh, every week, I'm looking forward to the. Yeah. Kind of sessions that okay today I'm going to learn something new about creativity and all those things yes so on behalf of all the participants who are there right now here or those who are not there even even on their behalf uh, thank you very much thank uh, you Dr. Shiva and everybody in, uh, who's part of the team behind making this uh, NPTEL and everybody who's part of this team to bring it on the uh, as a course program thank you thank you thanks lots. And uh, even I want to extend my heartfelt thanks because I was just waiting desperately for this. And as you said, Vinalni, you are like, you have some like-minded people who can discuss this frequently. I was, even now I feel it's just a beginning. I feel like uh, it's great if I have frequent interactions. Do mm. let me know how we can do that because it doesn't right. end here. Because when right. I enrolled in LEAD, similar to the sustainability programs, they have this uh, continuous education for others and they enroll there as an educator as well. Because creating resources and whenever they say there is a need, I'll uh, take some classes like that. It's just spending mm -hmm. some time with like-minded people and see how mutually we can benefit. Uh, yeah. So you please devise and let me know. Uh, I know it's my journey has just started and I just don't want to abruptly end here. And uh, I definitely want to be in touch with uh, this, actually. Absolutely. So please. Um, right. Send us your email IDs, Bridge and uh, Just send, write, write to us, no? You have my email ID, right? Uh, no. You don't have? Yeah, I think you connected on LinkedIn, no, uh, Shivakami? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I connected. Yeah. So you can just message. So what we'll okay. try to do is we are trying to create this Friends of Biomimicry kind of group. So let's do that and maybe, you know, we can start actually doing, instead of just having a forum, do something yeah. more uh, beyond that. Yeah. Bridge, your email ID will send it to me. Yeah, yeah he's posted it here. He had done it. I, anyway, I'll give it to you. Uh, anyway, I, I'll, uh, I'll get in touch with you through um, email. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Okay.
Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 -bye. Thank you.